Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Towergate day number 832, 832, July the 9th, 2019, Tuesday. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, before I get into today's news, uh, the video from yesterday uh, got cut off just a little bit early. I just ran out of time. I needed 10 more seconds. Uh, so I did not get the third place finisher in Dumbass of the Week. It was Nike. Nike. So uh, Dumbass of the Week this past week. Uh, in a huge blowout fashion, uh, crazy China Joe was the winner, Joe Biden, <clears throat> followed by uh, distant, uh, distant second place, Ocasio-Cortez, and right on her heels, Nike. That was your top three dumbasses of the week. <clears throat> okay, now that we've done that... <clears throat> Let's get back to the uh, still the big story that's uh, playing itself out right now, and uh, that would be the story on uh, uh, Jeffrey Epstein. We're learning now that he kept records, which included CD-ROMs of young women with other potential suspects and or participants. It appears that he has pled not guilty And uh, we're also hearing rumors that um, he was an FBI informant. Huh. Jeffrey Epstein, an FBI informant. There's a lot of shady characters who are FBI informants. Remember Mr. Greenberg? So, uh, a little bit of background here. This kind of all got kicked up again uh, because of a reporter uh, down in Miami who was working on the story along with Mike Cernovich who's been uh, pushing for this case to be reopened uh, because of the nature of the way the case was handled the first time around, which had a lot to do with um, um, Alex... Um, Acosta, who's currently in the Trump uh, cabinet. So, um, and when you look at his statement, uh, he's saying, well, you know, this was based on uh, all the factors of the case. We thought that this uh, was um, a good deal. Uh, so, uh, I don't know. I don't think you're going to be able to sell that. Uh, so, I think it will be my guess at this point, in my opinion, I, I should say, that Alex Acosta should resign. Alex Acosta should resign. I love Trump. He's great. But I will say, if he has one weakness, <clears throat> it is accepting the recommendations for cabinet-level appointments in his administration. I know there's a whole group of people, and we know there's a, a, a couple of people involved in there they're very questionable, who've been the people who've been making the recommendations to Trump uh, for people he should put in his administration. And this has been going on since he first became president. He's gotten some very bad advice on appointments. I think he, uh, hopefully, he's figuring this out and he will make some changes or start getting advice from other people about appointments because he's made some very questionable appointments and uh, this deal here with Alex Acosta is certainly one of them. Um, when you look at the facts of the first case, the 2013 case against uh, Epstein, there's a case before that even, uh, it, it's hard to believe he got 13 months and he didn't even have to go to jail every day. He only had to spend one day a week there and the other six days a week he only had to sleep there. He literally had a chauffeur-driven limousine that would come and pick him up and take him back to his office for 16 hours during the day. He was free as a bird. And then he would go back to the uh, so-called jail at night. And this was no jail like you or I would go to. <clears throat> he got one hell of a sweetheart of a deal. <clears throat> and I don't think that you can justify that any way, shape, or form based on the type of charges that we're talking about. So, yeah, there's a lot of funny things going on here. Of course, uh, Uncle Bob the Executioner was the FBI director at that time. And um, so uh, someone should ask Uncle Bob the Executioner 
if, in fact, he granted informant status to Jeffrey Epstein, and if so, why? And did that, did that have anything to do with the slap on the wrist he got for what would normally be the type of crime that would put you or I away for life? So someone needs to uh, someone needs to uh, get their head together on this thing. Um, so I don't know. We'll see what what happens here. Um, obviously, uh, a lot of people are going to be paying attention to this case, and I'd be very surprised if they try to give him a sweetheart deal again. Especially if they have CD-ROMs of young women with other potential suspects and or participants, not to mention they're talking about thousands of pictures that he had that are disturbing. So um, there's so much uh, attention being paid to this right now, I would be very surprised if he gets another sweetheart deal like the last time. And he could be looking at, you know, what would essentially be a life sentence given the fact that he's 68 years old. Um, and for that, he would probably probably be willing to give up some information, if you know what I mean. We have One American News Network. They're reporting that the Clinton Library is refusing to hand over information on Bill Clinton's ties to Epstein to them. One American News is trying to get information, um with Clinton's ties to Epstein that will be held, that is held there with the Clinton Library and they're refusing to turn that over. We also have Clinton's press spokesman releasing a statement. Bill Clinton's press spokesperson releasing a statement saying, Former President Clinton took four trips on Epstein's plane, one to Europe, one to Asia, and two to Africa. Secret Service was on every trip. He hasn't spoken to Epstein for over 10 years, and he has never been to Little St. James Island, the ranch in Mexico, or Epstein's home in Florida. That's the official statement from Bill Clinton, his sec press secretary. We have um, Cernovich, of course, was involved in the reopening of this case that led to the investigation. And Cernovich is now saying that he's also working to try to force the release of the names of over 250 members of Congress and their staff that have settled lawsuits over allegations of sexual misconduct. Okay, so we were talking about this about a year, year and a half ago, and uh, nothing ever really comes of that. Many people have talked about this over the years, but the people would have to vote to release that information are the members of Congress. And uh, I don't see that happening, but it should happen, absolutely. We should certainly know members of Congress that have had to pay, and their staffs, who've had to pay money out for sexual misconduct. <clears throat> so, uh, that's uh, what we know at this point. Um, I guess we'll be learning a lot more, I think, in two or three days from now, there's another court hearing, and maybe we'll find out more. I would not be surprised uh, if more people are caught up in this thing, although in the court hearing that went down today, on Monday, uh, we learned that there are no other sealed indictments. So there was a rumor that there was another sealed indictment, but there is not, uh, based on the hearing that we had on Monday. There is no other sealed indictments, but that does not mean that in the, the weeks or months to come in an effort to cut a deal that Epstein may drop the dime on some very powerful people. Um, I'm not sure how that works out because once you do that, I mean, you put yourself in a pretty bad situation, if you know what I mean, especially if you drop the Clinton's name. That usually does not work out well for you. Okay. It looks like, on some other news, it looks like, oh, one of the things being rumored that I'm hearing, I didn't write this down, but I just heard it about an hour ago, being rumored that Uncle Bob, the drive-by executioner, is considering 
not answering the subpoena. He is also apparently uh, considering postponing. So he's either thinking about postponing his testimony or I guess if he can't get agreement to postpone it, he is strongly considering uh, simply not showing up for the subpoena. That is what's being rumored right now. So we'll find out what happens there. Okay, in other news, I guess we had Swallowell, Eric Swallowell, has called it quits. He's called it quits. What's well, about time? He was polling at zero. Zero. So, zero the hero, Eric Swallowell, calls it quits. What took him so long? When you're polling at zero? My goodness. And uh, he says he's going to focus on his uh, congressional run. And a lot of people are saying he better focus real hard because he's being challenged by someone to his left. Someone more liberal than Swalwell is challenging him. He's being challenged by a Democrat who's farther to the left than he is. As bad as that sounds. I didn't think that was possible. But apparently it is. Also, good news on another front, Attorney General Barr says that he has found a pathway to put the citizenship question back into the census. Very good news. Very good news. I mean, this is big. This is important because it could mean the difference of two to three million votes. Illegal votes that were cast in the last election that hopefully if this census question uh, is put on here, maybe it will stop a couple million illegals from voting in 2020. Oh my goodness, more from Judicial Watch. Judicial Watch statement today saying, Hillary Clinton likely attempted to alter her emails in an effort to cover up illegal activities rather than just deleting her emails, as was previously reported. Hillary attempted to doctor, cover up, her emails for some reason, and in doing so, she inadvertently changed her email address. Now, that would be a severe violation, and apparently this is just uh, more information coming out uh, from the interview with Heather Samuelson, her attorney, who was the one who actually did the deletions of the emails. She's also the one who discovered there was three months worth of missing emails. That could not be possible uh, because of the backups and things and such that they have both with the government and with her private backups. And that means that this is why they're finding that she changed her email address. And uh, Judicial Watch gives the alternative email that she started using. So they now have that. And I'm sure they'll go looking for that as well. But that probably got bleach pitted too. Now I think that just about everybody knows that likely the things that were deleted were the communications that had to do with Clinton Foundation dealings. The Clinton Foundation dealings were the things that she was destroying, the evidence that she was destroying, the things that she had to cover up and hide. I'm pretty sure those emails we're talking about or emails that dealt with Clinton Foundation business. Another thing that's pointed out by Judicial Watch here is that in, in the process of their investigation, that the FBI would have had to have known what Judicial Watch knows now. That the rotten reverend attempted to doctor her emails for some reason, and in doing so, inadvertently changed her email address. Judicial Watch is saying it's very difficult to believe that they could have done the investigation and not learned what they are learning now. Uh-oh. More questions for Comey. Well, what do we have here? We have the wild-eyed Comey, Ocasio-Cortez. She just continues to one-up herself. Talk about self-owns, man. If they don't... You know, I, like I said a long time ago, I... I would not be surprised if she's a Republican plant. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure that's not true because we know how she got elected. 
Um, we know the little game that was being run there, along with uh, Omar and Talib and uh, the other one. That had to do with Sink Ugar's, Jink Ugar's group that was uh, running that little operation. <clears throat> That's how she got elected. <clears throat> but here we have Ocasio-Cortez, the wild-eyed commie, quoting Ava Perone. <laughs> quoting Ava Perone. We can only assume that, that the wild-eyed commie does not know that Ava Perone was a hardcore Nazi sympathizer, her and her husband, when they were running Argentina. In fact, they welcomed uh, the defeated Nazi soldiers from Germany to come to Argentina, to escape to Argentina, that they would have um, be welcomed to Argentina. There's even a rumor that's been going on for many years that Adolf Hitler escaped to Argentina. He was very close with uh, the Argentinian leaders there, very close. So we have the wild eyed commie, the rotten uh, Ocasio Cortez, rotten to the core, dumber than a rock, quoting Nazi sympathizer Eva Perone. Well done. Well done. Okay, Papagalopoulos tweeting out today that the US UK scandal that is going to make headlines this week is about the MI6 working in coordination with the CIA running Stefan Halper at me in London. Okay. That sounds good. Um, I'll be looking forward to that if that actually happens. I'm not so sure that that's going to happen this week. Maybe he knows something we don't know. <clears throat> and of course we have uh, Liawatha, Elizabeth Warren, uh, making a statement today saying that crossing the border illegally should not be a criminal offense. Crossing the border illegally should not be a criminal offense. Now, if she'd have worded that differently, like crossing the border should not be a criminal offense, that might have worked. But when you say crossing the border illegally should not be a criminal offense, it sounds kind of stupid. <clears throat> it sounds kind of stupid. Robbing a bank illegally should not be a criminal offense. My oh my. What a world. <laughs> okay, so the last couple days, <clears throat> last week actually, I've been focusing a lot on Joseph Mifsud. <clears throat> a lot of people are. As I said, he's key to this whole thing. Because if in fact it is true, and I'm about 99.999% sure that it is true, that he told Papagalopoulos that the Russians had dirt on Hillary in the form of thousands of emails, I'm pretty damn sure, about 99.9999% sure, that's exactly what Mifsud told Papagalopoulos. I believe Papagalopoulos is telling the truth about that. And I believe that Mifsud is lying. Remember, Mifsud, many months ago, through his friend and attorney, Mr. Rowe, uh, Mr. Rowe was saying that Miss Food is telling him that he was, that Miss Food feels he was set up. That he was set up. And I don't think he was talking about by the Russians. <clears throat> it's the only thing that makes any sense because if Miss Food didn't tell Papagalopoulos that, then who did? I think it's 99.999% sure that Mifsud did tell Papagalopoulos that. And if that is true, if that is true, that means that Mifsud was obviously working for some Western intelligence agency and that in fact it was a plot. And that's why they've got him hidden, probably given him a new identity and they're keeping him away from someone like Mr. Durham. But I'm pretty convinced that if the Department of Justice wants to track you down, 
They can. And you're talking about probably the Italian government or the British government who would be the ones hiding him. And certainly we could apply the pressure to them. And it's just a matter of time. He can't hide forever. And eventually the UK, Australia, uh, most likely I think the UK who, who's hiding him, are going to have to give him up. They can only play this hide-and-seek game for so long. <clears throat> now, because I've done so much research on this guy, I've read so much stuff on this guy, I've been following this dude for so long now, I'm seeing all the other things we've learned in the past year, and as I just said, I'm 99.999% positive that Miss Sud was, uh, in fact, did tell Papagalopoulos uh, that the Russians did have dirt on Hillary in the form of thousands of emails. I have come to the conclusion that even though it's not been publicly released and it's not 100% known, he's not admitted to it, there's no report, no John Solomon, no Paul Speary, nothing like that, just my own personal opinion at this point, having followed this guy and followed the story for this long, I am prepared to go out on a limb today and say that I believe, because everyone wants to know, who was Mifsud working for? <clears throat> you hear a lot of people say he was Italian intelligence and this and that and the other thing. Well, I'm going to go on the record today, on my video today, and say that I believe that when we get to the bottom of this, if we do get to the truth about Mifsud, I think we are going to find out that in this particular case, he was working for British intelligence. Whether he was working officially directly for British intelligence or through Hackloot or one of these private intelligence firms being subcontracted by official British intelligence, that I'm not sure. But I'm certain that he was working on behalf of British uh, interests in this particular plot. He may be an Italian uh, spy. He may be an Italian spy, but in this particular case, I am about 99.999% sure that he was working for British interests. And that could be British intelligence, a British private intelligence firm, something like that. I believe he was working for the British in this deal and that they were working very closely very closely with the CIA and the FBI. I believe when we get to the bottom of this plot, we're going to find that the UK was a lot more involved in this than is being portrayed at this point. And that's not a rip to my friends across the pond. Um, I don't blame British citizens for the illegal actions of their government and intelligence agencies any more than I blame any American for the activities uh, that were going on being carried out by the Obama administration, the FBI, the intel community, and all those things. It's not the citizens I'm talking about. I'm talking about corrupt government officials, both here and abroad. But all this talk about Russian interference, I think we're going to find when we get to the bottom of this, if there was any foreign country, and there was, that was involved in meddling in the 2016 elections, I think we're going to find that it was the British government it was really meddling, and I think that they're a lot more involved in this than what a lot of people believe right now. <clears throat> now, what are my reasons for believing these things? Well, I do remember uh, back in uh, the time when the, the Brexit vote was going down, and I remember when Trump was making comments about supporting the Brexit, and I remember how David Cameron was reacting to that, we know about the relationship between Barack Obama and Cameron, how close they were. We know what a threat that Donald Trump was at the time to the world order, particularly the European order, uh, New World Order, which Obama and Cameron uh, are big cheerleaders for and proponents of. So I have no doubt in my mind that Barack Obama, Barack Hussein Obama, may have contacted his good friend, David Cameron, 
and they may have talked about the mutual interest that they had in stopping Trump and how they could work together to do so. I do believe that this was communicated at the highest levels of both the U.S. government and the British government. <clears throat> now, reasons why I believe Mifsud was a British, was acting on behalf of British um, interests. Well, we know that Robert Hannigan from GCHQ flew to D.C. on at least one occasion to meet with John Brennan in the summer of 2016. We know that Mifsud is a member of the European Council on Foreign Relations and claims to be a member of the Clinton Foundation. We know about his close relationship with Claire Smith. They were both on the faculty at Sterling University. Claire Smith was in the upper echelon of British intelligence. She was a, rec a recruiter for MI6. She also taught cla a class to intelligence military officials at Link Campus along with Mifsud. Both Mifsud and Claire Smith were lecturers at the London Academy of Diplomacy, where Mifsud was the director. We know that Claire Smith vetted intelligence applicants while serving as the UK office security head. She's an expert. She vets potential intelligence agents. She's a recruiter of intelligence agents. Um, Misfit, we know, also spoke at the Central European Initiative Council alongside another British diplomat named Charles Crawford, who also has ties to UK intelligence. Of course, we have the famous photo of Mifsud, photographed with the British Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson. We know about the meeting with Downer. And Downer, of course, was Australia's High Commissioner to the UK, based in London. We know about Rob Goldstone, who sent the email to Don Jr. to set up the meeting at the Trump Tower there. He's a British music producer, who's also based in London, and he has intelligence ties. Goldstone, just like Steele and Mifsud, went into hiding after their names came out. We have Sir Andrew Wood, who is the former UK ambassador to Russia. He is the one who arranged for Senator Magoo to get his hands on the dossier. And he says that it was Christopher Steele that asked him to do that. We have Stefan Halper, the fat man. He has dual U.S. and U.K. citizenship with deep ties to the CIA and British intelligence. Spends half the year in London. If you look at everything that was going on, a lot of things were happening and centered around London. Papagopoulos was sent to Link Campus in Italy by a couple operatives in London. Then Mifsud came and paid a visit to Papagopoulos in London and they continued to communicate uh, by email. We also know that Mifsu does not speak Russian. We know he had a residence in London. Spends a lot of time in London. There's more. There's much more. Of course, we know about Mifsud's association with this group uh, that's sponsored by the U.S. State Department. We know that Mifsud was literally inside the U.S. Capitol, according to Devin Nunes, just steps away from a room where the House Intelligence Committee was holding hearings on the Russiagate thing. There is no way that all these high-level American and British and Italian and various other European officials 
would have this type of a long relationship with Misfood and he would have uh, the ability to get access to all these high-level people if he was a Russian agent. It's just not believable. And when you look at where all the activity was going on and you look at the stakes, how high the stakes were for David Cameron and the UK and the European Union and the greater you know, global community of which Barack Hussein Obama was a, a big proponent of, it certainly looks to me like the British intelligence working with and on behalf of Barack Hussein Obama, the Clintons, the CIA, the whole cabal. This is one big cabal, all working together. It appears to me that Miss Sood, regardless of what his allegiance is to what intelligence agency, Italian or whatever, that on, on this particular case in 2016, his activities and what he was doing, he was working on behalf of British intelligence. Uh, that's who he was working with, in my opinion. And I think we're, when we get to the bottom of this, that's what we're going to find out, that he was not a Russian agent. And people say he was Western. Yeah, he was Western, and, and, he, may have worked, and he may have done intelligence work for other Western countries. But in this particular case, I believe he was brought in by the British intelligence, who were working with and on behalf of U.S. intelligence and uh, Obama administration, along with the Rotten Reverend Clinton and her friends. That's what I would say at this point. Too many things were happening around and centered around London. Too many things. And if you look at that series of those three meetings, the Misfit and Papagopoulos, then Papagopoulos and Halper, then Papagopoulos and Downer. I believe what happened, I've said this before, is that Miss Sood was supposed to drop the dope on Papagopoulos. Then he was supposed to go back to London where Halper was supposed to get it from him. That's how that setup was supposed to work. Misfit drops it on Pops, Halper extracts it from him, and he gets it on tape or gets the recording. That's how that was supposed to work. But as we know, Papagopoulos smelled a rat. He clammed up. And he, just, and he described how angry Halper got. He was red in the face. He was frustrated. He jumped up from the table and he left. In a very, he was very angry. He left and left behind his honeypot to try to lure Papagopoulos over to the bar to get him drunk, uh, to take him up to a room and try to get some information out of him. And it's at that point that the thing got blown up because Halper was not able to get the information out of Papagopoulos. At that point, they called in from the bullpen, Alexander Downer. And who would have made that call? Well, we just recently learned something we suspected for a very long time, which is that the Rotten Reverend Clinton was getting regular updates from her uh, Perkins Coie attorney, M Michael Sussman, on the status and the things that they were learning from Christopher Steele or what have you. So she's getting regular updates. I'm sure that when that went down, uh, they were supposed to get the goods on Trump by having Papagopoulos say this to, to, uh, to, uh, to tell Halper what Misfit had told him. But when that didn't happen, they probably panicked and the Clintons probably turned to a close friend and they probably turned to Alexander down the hatch downer to come in and save the day. That's what it looks like to me. We're going to know a lot more in the weeks to come, but I'm going on record right now today to say that I believe that in the case of what was going on in 2016 and with Misfood, absolutely 100% sure he was working for Western intelligence, not a Russian agent, and I believe working for specifically brought into this thing uh, back in the summer of 2016. He was brought in by British intelligence. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'll be back tomorrow with more TowerGate. See ya. Bye.